the title says, we're going to look at claims and the disciplines and the structure of thesis statements. And what that really means to me is uh, we're going to look at what academics really do. So we're going <laughs> to, so the textbooks will tell us one thing in the abstract. This is how you write a thesis statement. But today I, I'd like us to just look at, okay, well, what do the academics really do in their published papers to write a strong thesis statement? And I think that's our, uh, our primary goal today and what this, this title uh, means to me, the structure of thesis statements in academic articles. Yep. So it'll be empirically based and uh, we'll be able to do some uh, style analysis on uh, texts from various disciplines. And then, uh, so it's an invitation uh, to look at these structures. So, uh, and uh, what I'm hoping that we, uh, that I'm able to impart or we're able to learn together is a method uh, as, uh, so that after the workshop, you can take this method and you can start uh, reading articles in your own discipline or other disciplines and start gathering a repertoire of phrases and material and linguistic structures that uh, make for strong claims and uh, strong thesis statements in articles. And uh, just a, a short caveat with the Leo Tolstoy uh, <laughs> quotation, it, it's actually uh, what academics do is actually both easy and complex. <laughs> I think this, that's uh, what we're are going to find. Uh, it's writing a thesis statement especially uh, situating it in the academic field is more complex than what's taught in the textbooks. Uh, on the other hand, uh, their explicitness in the way they uh, situate their thesis statements is actually uh, makes it easier for the readers to follow once they are familiar uh, with that, uh, the techniques that are used by academics to write their thesis statements. A workshop outline. We're going to take a look at the goals, uh, and then uh, I'll define a strong claim. So really, the workshop starts out, uh, you might say, in a, a more abstract way, uh, looking at some definitions and uh, characteristics of thesis statements. And if you look at item number three, uh, we'll, we'll look at how it's, thesis statements are what I refer to as traditionally taught or normally taught in textbooks and writing centers. So we have something to compare with uh, to a, a, what I call a dialogic or conversational uh, method um, uh, framed by argumentation. So the method we're looking at is actually a theory of argument. And we'll see how that <coughs> frames uh, our analysis of uh, research. And then item number four is the heart of the workshop. So that's our empirical analysis where we're going to discover, uh, well, what do these published academics really do <laughs> uh, compared to uh, what we've heard in the, in the uh, textbooks? And uh, so uh, the first thing we'll do is look at two examples together. It'll show that how I'll walk everyone through how to academics and literature and uh, then in, uh, uh, I believe it's environmental studies, how they uh, frame, how they situate and write their thesis statements. And surprisingly, even though the fields are quite different, we're gonna see that they do, the structure is quite similar, uh, the main structure of that. And then uh, we'll like take a very close look at the thesis statement uh, proper in uh, 4B and 4C. Uh, it's uh, your opportunity to perform your own analysis uh, discipline of your choice. I think we have seven available disciplines today. So our workshop goals, uh, I have them written as statement. Uh, here are our goals. Uh, practice a dialogic method to analyze. By dialogic, I mean co social conversation, essentially, to analyze thesis statements so writers can engage in self-directed learning to analyze these thesis statements. What academics really do is they create a dialogue and uh, that's true across any discipline, uh, at least as we're going to see in the examples we see today. And then uh, we'll uh, discuss your articles. Yep. So here are the uh, goals as questions. What strategy and method can academic writers use to learn how thesis statements are written in their disciplines and journal articles? So hopefully that's uh, what we accomplished today. 
And what is the generic form of written argument and thesis statements in academic articles across the disciplines? And how can we apply this method to revise our own writing? Those are uh, the goals of our questions today. So first, uh, the first part of our title, what is, uh, about strong claims, what is a strong claim in the disciplines? The first thing uh, that we're going to notice as we do our uh, investigation is that these thesis statements are made strong, the claims are made strong because uh, they're part of a written dialogue or argument. In fact, what we're gonna find is that the introductions, whether you're in science and engineering or whether you're in uh, literature, actually create a community dialogue. Uh, um, and that's one thing that uh, definitely makes a thesis stronger because it makes it part of a, com uh, a meaningful community conversation. Uh, the second uh, element that makes a strong claim and thesis statement is that it imitates the written part, actually imitates the social dialogue. So uh, now, what we're going to find is different is uh, linguistically uh, what linguistic forms each discipline uses. Uh, we're going to, uh, to create this dialogue, okay? This social dialogue that's happening in each discipline. And so uh, the key word you'll hear me uh, use is situate. So what hap So the better a writer is, it's situating their claim or their thesis statement in relationship to their field. Uh, it's having a particular debate about whatever question it is, uh, the stronger the thesis will be. And this uh, actually will become clear when you start to see our exam the examples from various disciplines. So the three important items here is that make a claim strong is that it's a written dialogue that imitates the question and answer of a social dialogue and therefore situates this claim in a meaningful conversation. Uh, it's written to others in the community, okay? But what I would like to do is defamiliarize ourselves a little bit. <laughs> uh, present the, uh, what I think a thesis statement, if you will, is not, but it's at least in terms of academic writing, but how it's taught traditionally in textbooks and, uh, and as we'll see some uh, writing centers. And it's thought of as the thesis statement, or the, and especially the claim in the thesis statement is a formal propositional uh, logic. So they're very, it's very abstract. So it's removed from a social conversation uh, and they just are isolated. They exist in themselves as short claims. And I'm gonna give you an example of this in just a moment. And they're not social because uh, uh, the way that some of the writing textbooks and uh, teach and uh, writing centers teach it, the writer talks to themselves and goes through a list of questions. But what we're gonna see that the academics do uh, to develop their thesis is they actually listen to their colleagues, ask them questions in the field, okay? And then <clears throat> these arguments uh, are valid, not because uh, some community agrees with them, but because they're formally valid. And so uh, they're more monologic. It's like somebody's talking to themselves. So you'll see, this is what we mean by the uh, formal and abstract. This is usually uh, example A of any logic textbook. <laughs> so you have the claim, Socrates is mortal. That would be your thesis statement. And then the support, and then uh, you, you have uh, something called a warrant, which authorizes that. But what you see missing is, that's what we mean by there's no question or answer. It's just a series of statements. And uh, we'll see that the Purdue Online Writing Lab actually gives an example of a thesis statement that only contains a claim uh, in, a, in a minute. And, but on the other hand, what the dialogic or the, the social conversation, uh, that method that we're going to use today assumes that number one, our scientific inquiry is an argument and it's an argument between people. Uh, specifically scholars and academics. And so that argument has a specific structure that's imitated in the linguistic structures uh, in these academic articles. And uh, it's a friendly conflict <laughs> most of the time. And uh, you can think of it as going to, there's going to be a, somebody asks a question, 
somebody provides a claim, uh, for example, uh, so I could make a claim that uh, uh, I am a U.S. citizen, and they would say, okay, well, what's your support? And then I would say, well, I was born in the United States. And then they would say, well, how, it, how does that authorize the connection between the cause and effect between you being a citizen? And I could say, well, it's written in the, in the law. And so the way that the ar argument advanced, that thesis advanced was actually through a back and forth question and answer. And that's usually missing from most textbooks. But as we'll see, it's very present in nearly every academic uh, article that's published. So as we said, uh, scientific inquiry is uh, largely carried out through argumentation. And um, we're all, uh, one of the, the first question that I, we asked is, well, what discipline are you from? And uh, these, whether we're from the humanities in general or science and engineering, uh, we can define uh, what we mean by a discipline. And I particularly like uh, Alistair McIntyre's definition of a tradition. I think it, it's an excellent definition of what disciplines are. Uh, what brings us all together really is to engage in argument or an exchange of ideas uh, through time. And so, for example, physicists, when Einstein first published his uh, theory of relativity, they had to react to it. And they're still reacting to it today, publishing articles. What does this mean? Uh, and they're arguing with each other in their published literature about what Einstein's theory of relativity might mean. Or uh, economists may be arguing uh, over uh, exactly um, uh, what, uh, whether debt, for example, is a good thing or a bad thing for a national economy. <laughs> so depending on what school you come from in economics, you'll, have, you'll be posing a, a certain uh, claim or thesis about those questions. And, that, and those arguments are what define who we are as a field. So, uh, whether, so it's the th those uh, terms that we talk about. So that as uh, you see in the second line, uh, where McIntyre says these fundamental agreements are defined and redefined in terms of two kinds of conflict, those with enemies external to the discipline. We're not going to be looking at that uh, today, uh, but then we're going to be focused on those internal debates, these interpretive debates, whether in science and engineering uh, uh, or the humanities or social sciences, it's this structure of argumentation that actually uh, my... Uh, my thesis is that is what uh, constitutes each discipline in the, uh, in the universities. And so we'll look at how that uh, verbal structure plays out in argumentation. The dialogic method then, uh, we have a, a workshop activity uh, for this. They're all part of a specific discipline. And uh, what debates or topics and questions are you currently researching or writing about? Or you could, answer either one of these, you don't have to answer both. What are the debates and questions or concepts that define your discipline that you're aware of that are currently, I would call them hot topics or uh, yeah, people are in conflict about. And I guess I could uh, start by giving you uh, an example uh, from rhetoric and composition. We, uh, we like to discuss uh, 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 whether it's writing is cognitive or social. <laughs> so there's an internal debate in my field about where exactly uh, the, we should be placing our uh, pedagogical energies. <laughs> should we be focusing on cognitive skills or should we be focusing on uh, the social skills of writing? And we'll see various arguments about that published in the literature. Uh, definitely bilingualism and, uh, uh, and how foreign languages should be taught. Interpretable versus non-interpretable AI. Very nice. What are the drivers of company performance? That's excellent. <laughs> yes. Uh, evolution of legal posit positivism and legal philosophy. Very nice. Sounds like we might have a, a lawyer in the group. There is a text uh, from law later on. Uh, technical communication and technical writing uh, topics. Uh, whether cognition plays a crucial part in teacher development or it's a combination of cognition and emotion. 
Uh, very nice debates. Environmental uh, patenting, uh, peer effect, and innovations. And who owns the wisdom of teaching English? <laughs> nests and non nests, or both. Uh, these, some of these examples then would actually, these are the arguments that define our disciplines. So our disciplines are about the questions that we have and uh, how we argue about those. And they define who we are. And uh, so I guess it's. Hans Gadamer used to uh, uh, said, uh, we are the conversation that we have. Uh, psycholinguistics, technical communication, and speech technologies. Very nice. So keeping in mind our debates uh, and uh, the structure of argument that our fields are defined by argumentation, what does the structure of argument look like in uh, an academic discipline? Well, uh, the original formal logic I, I uh, uh, gave you the example of a few slides ago, is now expanded. It includes uh, interlocutors or speakers talking to one another. So you would have a question, what kind of being is Socrates? Oh, well, I'm gonna answer he's, a, he's mortal. And what kind of reason or evidence do you support this claim with? Well, he's human. And what authorizes this, right? So we can imagine a dialogue going on. And uh, by the way, I wanna pause here for a moment uh, there, there was research that, that has been uh, done uh, about what's the differences between an expert writer and a novice writer, the differences. And one of the surprising uh, results of the research, it's Nancy Summers, if somebody uh, wants, I can share the article with you uh, later. Surprising thing is when uh, professional or expert writers revise, they actually, what makes them different than novice writers is they have a clear picture of their audience, of their reader, and they're engaged in a social dialogue. They are imagining it, of course, the reader's not there with them, but they're able to imagine that dialogue going on. And that helps them actually shape their written text. And that's what's going on here uh, with this discipline, our discourse communities carrying on a dialogue in the form of argumentation. It should follow question and answer, question and answer, call and response. What does this dialogic method of argumentation assume uh, as we begin to analyze uh, our thesis statements? Well, it's a social form. So the writing that you will see in these academic articles actually imitate the social structure that's uh, going on as if people were present talking to each other. So it's a communicative process. So there are people involved. Uh, it's question and answer, call and response. We'll see examples of that. So it's quite simple. As I said earlier, what academics do is complex. On the other hand, what they do is quite simple. In their introductions, they're creating a dialogue. And uh, uh, it follows a simple structure of question and answer. And then, uh, uh, you, so we have our claims uh, and support are initiated in dialogue with colleagues. And so our thesis statements are written by imagining an audience asking us questions. And the key word here is situate or locating. Uh, strong thesis statements and claims are made by locating our thesis statements in a larger debate. The better we are at creating that dialogue and debate in the introduction, the stronger the thesis statement will be to the academic community. Uh, here's an example of the traditional uh, method, uh, the method that I don't particularly uh, care for. <laughs> in developing uh, the method we're not going to use, but we should see an example. And this comes from the Purdue Online Writing Lab. Uh, it's their way of, uh, one way of teaching how to develop a strong thesis state. However, it's, uh, we'll see there there's a claim, America's anti-pollution efforts should focus on privately owned cars. And that's it. Uh, it's a single declarative sentence. It's debatable. It implies that there are other people, but it's only hinted at. There's no real dialogue. It's, and the goal of this traditional method is to narrow a thesis statement and focus. But the goal, I, I would argue, of a dialogic method if, in situating a thesis is actually, well, that's it. It's to situate it in a group. <laughs> in a group dialogue, not necessarily to narrow it. Certainly you want to focus it, but the goal is to, to situate it in an ongoing dialogue, not to narrow it per se. So, but this is what we teach students, right? 
And uh, I hope the field gets away from that soon. And then there are thesis is usually the last sentence of a paragraph. What we'll find in academic writing uh, is that a thesis is usually the last sentence of an introduction that could be anywhere from uh, five to uh, 12 paragraphs long. So uh, in the poll, here's the example. America's anti-pollution efforts should focus on privately owned cars. So if you could answer what's missing, if you think of the, this is the traditional method of uh, writing a thesis statement, but based on uh, what little we've uh, uh, reviewed about uh, the dialogic format, what's uh, missing in uh, this thesis statement? Oh, yep, definitely support there. Yes, exactly. There's no community dialogue. It's alone, right? <laughs> and there's no sense of urgency. And uh, exactly, there's a topic. There is a topic, anti-pollution efforts. Uh, we could say there is a claim. Uh, and uh, a problem is only Im implied, <laughs> right? We're not really sure what, uh, what, it, what it's... Uh, what it's tethered to or linked to, what this claim is linked to. And uh, by location, we mean situating it within other dialogues. We're not sure if this thesis is responding to someone else uh, in their field or not. Uh, now, the example was America's anti-pollution efforts should focus on privately owned cars. Traditionally, we're told in textbooks, well, this is your claim, that's your thesis. Uh, okay, that's true. However, in academic writing, it, uh, that thesis is accompanied by, if you will, or put in a, a very complex context. Of what's, and what we'll find is uh, when that's missing, really, when this, these things are missing, the question or the problem, the, there's no introduction, so we don't know the context, uh, the support, uh, it's just a claim. It's so actually, technically, it's an incomplete argument, a claim without support. And when you have claim without support, uh, not only is it an in incomplete argument, it also assumes there's nobody asking you a question to be accountable <laughs> for, your, uh, for your claim in a way. And also, you'll notice, for example, in uh, I do this uh, exercise in some of my critical thinking classes, is to watch a news uh, program or talk show. And when a speaker is uh, speaking, have the students count how many claims are made without any support, all right? Sometimes it could be uh, quite a few. And, and uh, the newscaster or the uh, person conducting the interview doesn't ask for uh, support for that. So uh, that's missing. Uh, the situation in the community dialogue is missing. And I think most importantly, people. So it's treated that. Now, it's true, you could say, okay, this is just the thesis, but it, it's weak. Without these accompanying things, the structure that goes with it, it's really weak and not very uh, dynamic. And so we're gonna take a look at how, how academics put all of these things together. So just to sum up uh, the traditional textbook, it's usually just a single declarative sentence, and you can make an argument for that and social structure of traditional propositional thesis. There's just to claim it. I am claiming this, right? And the goal is to narrow instead of to situate. And, uh, but it really has little to do with what actually happens in, uh, we're gonna see empirically what happens in academic journal articles. So to prepare us, we're going to look at our first uh, disciplines article. And you'll notice that, <clears throat> Uh, the introduction is going to be six paragraphs. And we're going to see a climax. It's going to climax to paragraph six, where you're going to see the thesis statement. And it's this, it's the creation of this dialogue 
that gives the thesis statement a real dynamic sense of urgency and gives it its, its meaning. So, uh, and this is what I call situating. So uh, the writer uh, of the first text, and it's going to be from literature, uh, uh, the literature or humanities, and uh, situ he creates a dialogue, and then he inserts himself into this with his thesis and claim, and it's complete. Not only does he just make a claim, we're going to find that the thesis is actually an entire short paragraph, three sentences. So he includes support uh, in that as well. So uh, can we go to uh, the handout A, actually? Uh, and the first question that we'll ask is, yep. <laughs> the author is Frank, and uh, the title of it is Poetry and Cosmopolitanism. So the first question, what are the key words in paragraph one, sentences 1A one and 1B that indicate the writer, it, which is Frank, is beginning to create a dialogue that situates his thesis statement? One respondent argues, yeah, and patriotism causes moral blindness. Um, that's not, it's part of his, uh, that phrase, is coming from his summary of Martha Nussbaum's argument. Yes, exactly. The author mentions another uh, author. And if you look at that, uh, the phrases we're looking for here are Nussbaum argues that, Nussbaum's cosmopolitanism emphasizes, right? So he's already, it's like he's created a dialogue. Nussbaum says, and the rest of the paragraph then is a summary of what she thinks. Right. So uh, and she's a philosopher, uh, by the way, who argued for a cosmopolitan form of education being taught in uh, American schools. So her and then you see phrases like her cosmopolitan worldview is and then patriotism for Nussbaum hinders. So he's complete. He's basically said uh, to simplify it, has said Nussbaum says. <laughs> right. But. It, you're going to see the phrases we're looking for are Nussbaum argues and Nussbaum's cosmopolitanism emphasizes. So in paragraph one, he's already starting the dialogue, which will uh, climax. In paragraph two, sentences 2a two and 2b, what are the key words that indicate the writer is beginning to describe a debate? So now what he's going to do is he started off, Nussbaum says, and now he's going to say, and we started to debate this. And what concept is the community arguing about? A uh, problematic, contentious issue, right? It's problematic, so he's saying, hey, she uh, introduced this concept uh, related to education. He, he doesn't mention that it's related to education. I just know that from having uh, read it. Uh, uh, yes, and he described a range of reactions. Uh, very good. So. Uh, what he's done is he, he's talked about, so now he's literally, he's actually, uh, he is writing the social dialogue that's going on among uh, philosophers, uh, uh, poets, and um, literary scholars about this concept of, of cosmopolitanism. So uh, things like, uh, it is problematic Reading the responses to her essay, one begins to see how contentious an issue the cosmopolitan is. Reflecting on other of these responses, Jeremy Waldron writes, so we have another phrase, right? And then if you go down a little bit further, he says Waldron's uh, argument is directed at Robert Pensky. So he has created this, uh, a nice little community argument. <laughs> Right, and they and he now starts to insert himself and say, "I find this disappointing." So he's starting to situate himself in the argument, uh, as we'll see. You will find, as we do the analysis, I focus a lot on signal phrases, on phrases that writers use to introduce other people's arguments. I think that's uh, learning those phrases is key to understanding how to create these dialogues within your discipline. Each discipline has their own style of doing that. So he has a number of reporting verbs that uh, uh, he's using for uh, reporters. Like Pinsky suggests that, 
Pinsky shows, Pinsky describes, and then this insight into the dual, if sentence three I, this insight into the dual nature of the local teaches Pinsky that because of its rich complex complexity, Pinsky argues that. So now we reached Pinsky's thesis, right? So we have claim and counterclaim going on. So uh, Frank is creating a nice little dialogue here. And uh, if you look at sentence 3K, the end, the final sentence of paragraph three, you'll see that he comes to the, the point of the matter. Uh, this is what the gap, if you will, or the problem that his, that his thesis statement is going to answer, that the eros of patriotism needs to be counterbalanced by an eros of cosmopolitan, of the cosmopolitan. And that's what now, now he's given his, he's situated his thesis, which will follow in paragraph five. And as we'll see in a second, it's given his thesis urgency. It's placed it in a dialogue, right? In paragraph five, what are the signal phrases uh, uh, the writer uses to indicate he is introducing himself into the debate? So uh, let's take a look. Paragraph five. As I said, what academics do is both simple and complex, <laughs> right? So they're using all of these simple reporting verbs and phrases. I will argue, Pinsky argues, Waldron stated, right? And, uh, but they're using these simple phrases to create a very complex social argument within the field, right? I hope to dispel and by showing, right? Excellent. They look like a literature review. That's right. <laughs> uh, I prefer to think of it as a dialogue <laughs> because I, I, I feel like a literature review sounds like uh, mm, it's not as dynamic. That's my, uh, it doesn't reflect the social nature of argumentation uh, as, as much as, uh, yeah, that's good. So uh, that's what we've learned. Now, this is in literature. A couple of things I would like to point out is uh, uh, Frank is a poet uh, and, and a literary critic, and he's uh, writing about poetry. Nussbaum is a philosopher. Uh, I'm, I don't remember uh, what Jeremy Waldron is. Uh, uh, sorry about that. Uh, Pinsky is also a poet, and Herbert is also a poet. So this is the community that, uh, that Frank has created, and uh, it's pretty impressive. And so you, the, back to the question, you know, so a thesis statement has all seven parts of these. When we think of a thesis as being part as in terms of a dialogic uh, method of analysis, I would say, yes, it has all of those uh, parts. So the thesis is even, I would include uh, the introductory paragraphs that frame the entire thesis. They give it its importance. So I think we've already covered the thesis statement. So you, here's the simple structure, call, the community says, and response. That's the simple structure of, or the social dialogic structure of thesis statements in literature. Now, uh, as we know, as we know, uh, you know, it's said that the natural sciences and the sciences are diff much different, right? <laughs> uh, in some ways they are, but in creating the dialogue, they are not. They're doing the same thing. It just looks a little bit different. In this example that we're going to do together, uh, so we're looking, uh, I believe it's from environmental studies, and uh, it introduces, a, this time it introduces a concept first, then it develops this concept, as we're going to see, and then it's, it develops the importance. And you, you see, again, it's coming to a climax, right? This debate is they're starting to create this uh, dialogue and debate. And then uh, at paragraph four, it's explicitly stated, hey, we're having a debate, <laughs> okay? And then uh, it outlines the analysis. So the first thing in paragraph five that they uh, place is the support for their thesis, right? So it's more of an inductive approach. And then he states his claim and his thesis, he situates it. So he situates, or the writers, I'm sorry, there's more than one in this case, situate themselves in this. So in this case, it's on handout uh, A, again, it's below the literature text. It's text G, uh, 
page. It's, uh, I'm no. sorry, it's text B. Oh, B, yes, page five. Oh, I should note that on page, uh, I also have mapped the dialogues. Uh, so if you look at uh, the handout, if you look at page three, you'll see that there's the dialogue mapped. And in that case, I pointed out what I thought or what I think are the important phrases that help the writer make uh, write his uh, dialogue all the way to his thesis. Okay, and then you're right, on page five is when the, the uh, text, like uh, Costanza, uh, uh, De Groot, and Sutton uh, appears, okay? And the title of the text is Changes in the Global Value of Ecosystem Services. And it was published in the Global Environmental Change uh, Journal. And then you have, uh, yeah, and then it, it starts. So, uh, okay, our first question. So again, let's go through this and see how an environmental scientist builds the dialogue. In paragraph one, sentence 1A, what key discourse community concept does the writer introduce? Uh, right, uh, ecosystem uh, specifically, uh, and I would link, as we're gonna see later, he links it with ecosystem services, right? So we introduced that, ecosystem services. All right, uh, next question. In paragraph one, sentence one B and D, what key phrases signal the introduction of a debate? So he's already starting quite soon to introduce this debate. Uh, one is that interest grew rapidly. And uh, then at the end, at the very last phrase of the paragraph, you see stimulated a huge surge uh, in, in this topic, right? So you start to see him, uh, the writers are framing this uh, debate there. Sometimes we call it they found a gap in the research, something that was overlooked. They uh, identified a problem or a question. And that's what they're doing in, with this dialogue, also called a literature review in a way. Uh, so yeah, and question number three, in terms of situating the writer's thesis statement within a dialogue, community dialogue, what is the function of the in-text citations? And uh, this is uh, really the key difference between the literature text and the uh, uh, science-oriented text. Because you see, uh, one thing you see missing are quotations. So most of this is paraphrased. The other thing is, instead of using reporting verbs uh, and actually creating it, uh, an explicit dialogue, the dialogue is created through the citations themselves. So those citations in blue are actually people talking to each other. And that's uh, in the science, how that dialogue is uh, still created. Yeah, what key phrases in paragraph two and three indicate that the writer is establishing the importance of the debate within the discourse community. So again, we're focusing on the phrases that create this dialogue. So it would be impossible, gain broader attention, exactly. So he is, uh, Starting uh, hundreds of projects and group. If you see sentence 2G, hundreds of projects and groups are currently working, right? So, and then the most important contribution, right? So he has that uh, widespread recognition. Let's see, what else do we have? Yes, the TEAB report was picked up extensively. Yep. So again, they're creating another uh, dialogue there back and forth. And then to create a sense of urgency, the final sentence of three, paragraph three, if you see that is, this reframing of the way we look at nature is essential to solving the problem of how to build a sustainable and desirable future for humanity. So they've, they've created a sense of urgency and they've explicitly pointed to a community problem now in framing that. In paragraph four, what key phrase uh, does the writer use to introduce the debate in which he will situate his thesis? I think I may have already. So again, they're explicit. There has been an ongoing debate. He also adds uh, another phrase. And what others see as flaws, that's important actually that they see as flaws, yes? The critiques are misplaced, right? We think, right? So he's uh, it's 
That's excellent. Excellent. So he looks at this, uh, and to, so they're now they're entering the debate, right? These authors. We think that these critiques are largely misplaced, right? So we disagree. <laughs> so uh, here you have the creation of another disciplinary argument, uh, right in time. That's very good. Uh, in paragraph five, the writer introduces the article's analysis and support for his thesis. What are the key phrases that introduce the four types of analysis that will be support their claim? So one is we update. So they update estimates based on new data. Yep. Update, estimate, review, compare. Right. All of those nice, uh, <laughs> right, uh, those verbs that they explicitly state what they do. And what they're doing here is they're actually, before they state their thesis, there's, they are outlining the support for their thesis from their analysis and their uh, data. So by doing all of these things, we're going to support our thesis. And uh, that's uh, what they uh, are, uh, <clears throat> are going to write next in the next paragraph. How do they introduce, what phrases do they use to introduce their thesis? And this actually gives us a nice, uh, something we could write down and uh, keep with us, a nice way of a uh, couple of phrases, linguistic structures we could use in our own writing. So uh, we advocate is, uh, is one. I would take sentence uh, uh, one, or uh, sentence 6F and 6G together and include them together. We do not claim that. Uh, don't claim quite the contrary. So they're creating, again, they're creating this dialogue, this social dialogue with those phrases. That's very good. Yes. So that's what they do. We do not claim that. Quite the contrary, we advocate. And so they strongly state their uh, thesis. And then in 6H, they explain uh, more of their claim. Notice that this thesis statement is actually three sentences long. It's not a, a single sentence. Yep. Uh, in contribution with other contributors at the very end. Yep, that's the, uh, that, the, the uh, idea that <clears throat> the importance of ecosystem services relative to and in combination with other contributors to sustainable human well being is the continuation of their <clears throat> complete claim, right? We have a call and response again. So there has been an ongoing debate, right? So the field has called them, there's this debate and they respond to it. We do not claim that, quite the contrary, we advocate. So you see this, again, dialogic structure to the, uh, the situating of a thesis statement. So let's look at uh, the thesis statement itself. So, so far, what I hope we've seen is the way I, I'm focusing the analysis is on, um, if I were reading, I'd be looking for key phrases these key phrases of how the dialogue is going and, and two things, key phrases and concepts. That's what I would be uh, looking at. And then uh, on a deeper level, who is saying what, <laughs> right? As they start to introduce the dialogue, uh, who, what sides are on the debate? What, what, yeah, who's on what side of the debate is important. Now, let's look at the thesis statement itself. Okay, so now we're going to uh, move away from the entire introduction, where it's, and the goal there was to see that thesis is situated in a dialogue. And now we're going to look at the structure of a thesis statement in and of itself. Okay, and uh, what we're going to find is, whereas the Purdue OWL, if you remember at the beginning of the presentation, had one single sentence, right? Just the claim. What you find in academic uh, articles is you have a claim. It just asserts something that the writers want to say, and it's related to the debate or topic. They also include support for their thesis. So our academics tend to, there are uh, uh, unordinary uh, or anomalous situations, but they tend to always write complete arguments as thesis statements claim and support. Uh, and then you'll see what academics also do. The third thing is they outline how the argument will unfold. So they map uh, the, uh, the argument. So 
I would include these three things. Number four is what we just went over. The implicitly or explicitly a thesis answers a question or responds to a problem developed in the introduction, right? So, but right now we're going to look at the claim support and outline at that structure, which is usually uh, very often included in most academic articles, especially the ones we're going to study here. So again, on the same handout, this time uh, page eight, we'll take a look at text C, foreign affairs and international relations. <clears throat> this text, millennials and US foreign policy. Uh, I like this one because it provides an ideal example <laughs> uh, of the species that we're thinking of. If we, if we look at this, we could say that the, the thesis statement here, I'm just, if everybody's uh, looking at it, I'll just walk us through it uh, here. We see, we see that, uh, again, they're using these verbal phrases, right? Uh, we argue that, right? And uh, a pattern of foreign policy attitudes that is distinct from their predecessors. Our millennials are imprinted with a pattern of foreign policy attitudes that is distinct from its, their predecessors predecessors. This is their claim. The next thing that happens is they state there's, it's as if some, they're imagining somebody asks them the question, well, that's interesting. So what, what's your support? What do you have to go on? And you can easily imagine the word because here, because millennials perceive the world to be significantly less threatening than, than do their elders. Oh, somebody, uh, yeah. Text C, page eight, and uh, uh, are more likely to support inter international cooperation uh, than the unilateral use of military force and may have a permanent case of what we call Iraq aversion. So here you have a complete argument now, claim plus support. And then they complicate it. <laughs> they have a caveat or an additional claim. With all that said, Millennials also resemble their predecessors. So now they have a, a two-sided claim, right? So, and th so really their, their thesis statement proper is three sentences long here, okay? And then the second paragraph is simply, uh, as we said, the three parts, you have a claim, support, and then the outline. So you're going to see the outline here. The, and they use these phrases to introduce their outline. The following section reviews, we then provide, along the way, we also provide input from, we conclude with the discussion of. So uh, I would say that this is a complete academic argument right here, or thesis statement. It's got a claim, support, and it outlines uh, how the article's argument will proceed. So it's your turn to do your own analysis. There are seven handouts from a variety of fields, humanities and literature, law, economics. Uh, uh, I have to remember all of them, right? I put them together, I should remember. So their literature, science and engineering is a very interesting one. Uh, and uh, I like it because uh, it also creates a dialogue. So you can see similarities across disciplines from literature to science and engineering. You have economics, uh, international relations. It's the one we just saw, uh, read, business and sociology, environmental studies and law. Those are the seven handouts. And each handout contains uh, a set of questions. And then, so I should go over how they're organized. So each handout, <clears throat> at the top contains a set of questions, right? Uh, for analysis, then it's followed by the text. And uh, to facilitate the analysis, I make some highlights or underline uh, some sentences or phrases. <clears throat> the way I would analyze it, you may have a different uh, way of analyzing it. Uh, and then there's a, a word at the end, of the text that says analysis, and then that uh, is my analysis. And then uh, that has 
a summary of the analysis, a dialogue map. So I pulled out the key phrases that uh, create a dialogue. <clears throat> and then I analyzed the thesis itself. So choose the handout that you would like to, that's relevant to your field or that you would like to analyze. You can work individually and analyze the text, starting with those questions. And then you can compare with uh, uh, my analysis and we'll probably find similar and different uh, answers to the questions. So some of the things that, they, uh, that is common with this dialogic method is that it's social. So people are important in this. It follows the structure of question or problem and answer or call and response. And then the thesis is not just a claim, but it's a complete argument. It usually has a claim, support, and an outline. And of course, we're talking about academic articles uh, <clears throat> and not uh, more popular articles uh, or essays and uh, one or more paragraphs. So in this case, whereas I gave you the example of Purdue Owl, uh, noting that uh, a sentence is a single declarative sentence or a thesis is a single declarative sentence. It's not just Purdue Owl. There's a, a, a book on argumentation. Here's another book on argumentation I really like and I can suggest to you. It's a, a classical rhetoric for the modern student. It's a very good book on argumentation, but they also define a this is one uh, drawback, I think. They define a thesis in a very large, well, it's a classical rhetoric, so it's very <laughs> a, a, a propositional, logical, very formal approach. So they also define a thesis as a single declarative sentence in that respect. So um, it doesn't include the other two parts, the support and the outline necessarily. But, uh, and then it's, so the thesis statement can be uh, one or more paragraphs or three sentences or more. Now what's unique <clears throat> across different in disciplines is how the uh, speech is reported, right? So as we saw in the first example, in the literature example, they're stating the author's names like Nussbaum argues, Pinsky states, you know, Waldron, uh, you know, directs his, his criticisms toward, so, so the writers are there, it's like uh, you can see them, but, and then and you get science and engineering and in uh, environmental studies or economics, as we saw there, the people are still there. They're just now they're uh, reported in this citation, the in-text citations. And you'll also see uh, on the continuum of disciplines, the further away you get from the humanities and more towards the very pure hard sciences, uh, it's very rare you'll see a quotation. It'll be uh, paraphrases. <clears throat> and then uh, the location of the thesis statement, uh, we didn't look at it, uh, we could, but in engineering and science where they have their inductive methods, right? So they, they carry out an experiment, uh, right? They have their scientific method. You'll find that the uh, in the example I have with engineering and AI that they, they stated, it clearly stated a research problem, which a scientist would do. And then they hypothesized uh, about it. And their, but their conclusions come, well, they come at the end of the uh, article in the conclusion, but, and they, at least in the example I have, they're stated, we demonstrate that, we illustrate that, we show that through our uh, research and data. So then they come to a, a strong conclusion uh, at the end of the essay. And what counts as evidence and support? That would, that's where we would naturally lead to next. And uh, someone, I can't, somebody asked, is this dialogic approach act applicable, Maria, not only to the introduction, right? And that's where we would go next. What counts as evidence and support? So that would naturally lead to the body of the essay. Uh, and that would be another uh, workshop <laughs> uh, topic. How, how, how is evidence and support treated in the bodies of articles uh, from discipline to discipline? So here's a quick summary. Uh, think questions you can ask. Uh, what is the problem or debate or question developed in the introduction? Uh, what are the main articles you're responding to or entering into the debate with? Uh, 
you can call that a literature review, but I think it, it, it lacks energy and it's not as dynamic. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's more, much more pleasant to have arguments with people rather than things. And uh, what question or problem does your thesis or claim answer that's important to the community, we might add, and what is the support for your claim? How do you organize and develop your support in your article and what is your unique about your claim? And I think uh, this is, can be answered when you outline your uh, analysis. So if you think of the three parts, uh, the claim, support, and outline, these next questions, what does it add to the debate? How does your thesis change or confirm a theory? Does your thesis suggest a new line of questioning? I think uh, that can be added to the outline portion of the thesis statement, the article. So uh, just su suggestions for self-learning. These are questions that you can keep in mind. They're basic. As you read through the journals that you might want to publish in, how many paragraphs is the introduction? How does the writer develop a problem or question? Or uh, not, if you're in history, maybe. I, I, they probably still might develop a, a problem, but not have a, uh, a literature review. Uh, and then what phrases does a writer use to introduce colleagues Claims. I think this is uh, well. It's very helpful for students. Is keeping a repertoire of these phrases. Uh, that's often, I think, where uh, student writers and uh, professional writers struggle. How do I introduce this or that uh, uh, conclusion or claim from another writer? Uh, where is the thesis located? Okay, is it the last pa paragraph or is it in the conclusion of the essay? What phrases does the writer use, uh, sorry, the last paragraph of the introduction or the conclusion of the essay? And what phrases does the writer use to signal a thesis statement? And how many sentences is the thesis statement if you include the claim support and outline? And keeping a journal of these phrases uh, of helpful, what we call rhetorical moves, uh, I think make writing your thesis statements strong across the discipline. That's all I uh, want to thank everyone for being here. That's all I have. We have the references. Here's the reference for uh, Crosswhite, who has a very good theory of argumentation. And you'll find that he has an excellent bibliography as well.